Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to another 80 golden age of comedy. I'm your host, Bruce Starr. And the way this whole thing came about was, you know, in 1981, I was living in Boston and friends of mine said, what are you doing here? Come on out to Los Angeles. We'll see what we could do to, you know, hook you up and get you going. And I got, that was enough because I was wondering what to do next. And uh, I got in my car, drove clear across country. And my friend Mitch uh, came and got me at my sister's place. Got me in his car, drove me over to the improv, sat me right there in the improv and said, this is where you're going to live from now on. <laughs> you want to be in the business? This is the place. So literally just about every night of the week, uh, I went to the improv and got to know everybody that worked there. I mean, at the time, and I think my guest Kevin will tell you that everybody was just a person. We weren't superstars. We weren't... Uh, you know, uh, household words yet. And everybody that we were around, we were friends with from Jerry Seinfeld to P Paul Reiser. And, you know, the, we can go on and on and on. And we had a great time. And then evening at the improv hit in 81, just literally months after I got there. And that's when all the comedy clubs exploded all around the country. And my roommate, Barry Martyr, who my guest Kevin knows, uh, he said to me, why don't you make calls for the comedians? Uh, their big time agents don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. If they, maybe some of them do, but well, some of them don't. Why don't you ask them if uh, you can make the calls for them? And since we we're all friends and uh, got to know each other real well, 35 of them over the next couple of months said yes. And it was a phenomenal opportunity to not only make me money, but to make them money and to get to know an incredible group of professionals that has gone down in the history books as the golden age of comedy. And so one of the guys that I hung around with, we had a group of you know five or six that we just spent a lot of time with in the beginning days, is Kevin Kelton. Kevin, welcome to the show. So hey, good Bruce. to see you. Thanks for having me. And as I mentioned to you before, I want to say this to our listeners. If you hear thunder in the background tonight, that's not a special effect. We're having giant thunderstorms here and I'm under a tornado watch. Wow. So this could be a dramatic uh, podcast as well as a funny one. So if I see you like spinning and taking off, I'll know exactly what's going on. Is that what you're Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. And get it on CNN as soon as you can. I want to be remembered. <laughs> if I die, I want it at least to be for a good cause and I get some CNN time. <laughs> so, you know, Anybody that steps foot into the improv, really anyone, has to be funny. Uh, or if they weren't funny, they were an agent or manager. <laughs> and, you know, they were off to the corner, you know, sitting at the round table there. Yeah. But I didn't know really how funny some of the people could be. Uh, and what I'd love to know from you is not only were you a uh, part of a comedy, but you were part of a comedy family, which is very rare. I haven't, I, I don't think I've had anybody on the show, uh, brothers coming on the show. So tell me about your family, where you were brought up, what that was like, and did it have anything to do with you getting into comedy? Yeah, well, of course, you're referring to my two brothers, Tommy and Dickie Smothers. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, uh, you're referring, of course, to my brother, Bobby Kelton, who was a stand-up and is a stand-up and is still thriving. He lives in Florida, out where you live. Um, but the answer to your question, first of all, I didn't hear your question because I was thinking about my joke. But, uh, <laughs> but I think you asked about my, my upbringing. And uh, it was, I have four brothers. I'm the youngest of four boys. And it was a comedy household, but we did not know we were a comedy household. We thought everybody was like us. And we were into stand-up comedy. Uh, Bobby would tape the shots of people that were on The Tonight Show in the 60s. We had this little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and we still have you know, tapes of John Biner and Flip Wilson on The Tonight Show. This wow. was his hobby. Wow. And um, we, um, 
we would do bits ourselves. We, we memorized the first family album and we would recreate it. And, and we went off script and did our own bits. Bobby played John Kennedy. My brother, Bruce, played various characters. My brother, Mike, played Bobby Kennedy. Our cousins, who, the, who, the females of the family, played Jackie and, and other characters. And this is what we would do, especially when we all got together for Thanksgiving weekends and all the cousins were together. Isn't that something? So that album has had more of a dynamic effect on Americana than they even knew in the beginning because you're far from the first person that said, we know every line in that movie, in that uh, album. Yeah, that and uh, my son, the folk singer, uh, listened to it constantly, had a Jackie Mason album at home, the button down mind of Bob Newhart, um, a Jackie Vernon album. Uh, and, and, you know, we just listened to them until the grooves were gone. Wow. So what's the next step after that? So you have a family of, of, of boys, goodness gracious, that love comedy. But what do you do with that? <laughs> well, first of all, none of us thought that we were going into show business. It was just a hobby, like playing stickball. You know, it was just something we did. Um, so two of my brothers became attorneys. Actually, the funniest one of us, Bruce, the oldest one, is a judge now, <laughs> he's a federal judge. And he's much funnier than Bobby or I ever will be. Wow, uh, wow. But, but, uh, but he didn't have the, the, the knack to do it in front of a, a, he couldn't do it on demand the way we can. But anyways, so when I was in college, Bobby, who's seven years older than me, had already graduated and had knocked around in a couple of jobs. And then he did uh, some open mics at the comedy store and became a regular. And so that became his passion. This was April of 1974. Wow. And I remember he would send uh, um, cassette tapes home to my parents so they could hear his act. And as you know, Bruce, nobody starts off great. No. He was awful. I mean, his cassettes, and he tried to be inventive. He tried to do um, bits that weren't really right for him. He, he was more of like an Albert Brooks type of character when he first started. And the, the, he would send these cassettes of him doing these bits with no laughter whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, death, death. And my dad, our dad was a, a certified public accountant. Um, as, as straight laced a guy as you can ever have. A great dad, we love him, but he was not a funny guy. And he would, you know, get these tapes and listen to them. And then he would rail for like, you know, 20, 30 minutes on end. He's throwing his life away. What did we, what did we spend $40,000 on college for, for him to do this? You know? Which by the way, I'm sure many of your guests could tell similar stories. Exactly, about. exactly. But Bobby was persistent with it. And, you know, if you have enough talent and you do something enough, you're going to get better at, and maybe even good at it. Um, you, you know, the, um, the, the 10,000 hour rule um, that uh, I'm forgetting the name of the author, famous author who wrote a book about the 10,000 hour rule. People who do something for 10,000 hours generally get very good at it. So in 75, Bobby was, he was a regular at the comedy store. And his contemporaries were Leno and Letterman and Tom Dreesen. And I could just keep naming names, George Miller. But he was getting, he was getting, you know, good spots, but not as many as he thought he needed to get good. And he heard that if you go to New York, there were three clubs there. Out here at that time, there was only the one club, the comedy store. And in New York, you had the improv, Catch Rising Star, and then eventually the comic strip. And you could do six shows a night going from club to club to club, first show, second show. So he moved back to New York and started working primarily the improv and catch. And I was in college at that time. So when I wasn't at school, when I was home uh, in Rockville Center, Long Island, I would go out with him at night to the comedy clubs. Uh, you know, he'd get me a, a free Coke at the bar and I'd sit in the showroom and I'd watch acts and I'd watch him. And this would go on until 3.30 in the morning because wow. New York, the, the club stayed up, stayed open later there. And then the comics would go out to the Green Kitchen, which was right down the block. Uh, what uh, people who watch Seinfeld would know as monks, but it was the Green Kitchen back then. And the comics would hang out for another couple of hours 
and they'd be trading lines, trying to hone each other's acts, um, trying bits. And I was sitting there just absorbing this. And what I didn't realize was I was going to comedy college free, you know? Absolutely. On, Absolutely. on someone else's dime, I was getting a professional education just by osmosis. Do you remember who you were sitting around with? Who, some of the people? Bobby's that- best friend in 1975, 76, 77, 78. His best friend was Larry David. Larry David came to our house. We had Thanksgiving dinner with him. I played golf with him. Uh, he was around constantly. Um, uh, D- 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 John DeBellis was part of that trio. I don't know whether you know John. I don't know John. And some people have tried to connect me with him. Quite frankly, he hasn't returned the calls. So I, you know, stopped trying to connect with him. Well, maybe but- I can help you with that afterwards. But um, but John, a very funny comedian and a very talented uh, joke writer, uh, wrote jokes for virtually everyone. But the three of them were inseparable. Uh, but also, again, uh, Leno a little bit uh, was, was there at the time. Belzer was there. Bob Shaw, Ed Bluestone, Barry Diamond, who you had on the show, and Glenn Hirsch. And, you know, the reason I'm here tonight is you you asked me a few months ago to do it. It was in the middle of the COVID thing. I had other things on my mind. And a couple of nights ago, I think I saw a post, maybe it was one of your posts, but I saw a post about your podcast. And it was two in the morning. My fiance is asleep downstairs. I'm not allowed to turn on the TV because I can't wake her up. So I put in the headphones and I listened to your podcast. And it's Barry Diamond and Glenn Hirsch. <laughs> now, let me tell you about this. Those two guys were heavy, heavy regulars at the improv back when Bobby was just coming up, okay? They were all contemporaries. And I have a a deep, not personal relationship, but for me, a personal relationship with both those guys. Glenn Hirsch was like my brother's best friend to me when I was growing up. You know, I don't know whether you had older brothers, but if you do, and they would have friends who'd come over the house and they were sort of like mini uncles to you because right. they were always around and they knew me as little Kelton, right? Well, Glenn Hirsch would be one of those people. And I have a, a real fondness for him and um, a few other people, some of them are no longer with us. Glenn Super being another one of those. Oh. Yeah, great, great guys who I just knew them so well because they were my brother's really good friends. Barry Diamond, I don't know that he and Bobby were so much friendly, but Barry was one of the acts that I would see at the improv night after night after night. And I thought and still think that Barry Diamond, people use this word and they use it very loosely, but I will say he is a genuine comedy genius. And I always thought that if someone was going to break out big, I thought it would be Barry Diamond. Um, To me, he was as funny as anybody who ever worked those clubs. I still love the act that he did back then. And so seeing that podcast, it was was like, you know, a family reunion for me. Wonderful. So every once in a while, I get to uh, work with someone who knows someone intimately that people would love to know about their, their private lives, like Andy or Robin. And I've had people talk uh, intimately about what they were like. Would you mind speaking about Larry? Because people really don't, they might know Larry, uh, but does the public, does anybody really know Larry? And if, could you share what you knew about him that made him so different? Okay. Well, first of all, to be fair, although Larry and I have worked on a couple of TV shows uh, in the 80s, and I, I, I run into him sporadically these days, and I mean really sporadically. So I don't want to pretend that I can speak to who he, he is now no, before. As, a, as a man in his 70s. Okay. Right, before, right. But uh, when I was 20 and he was, you know, maybe seven to 10 years older than me at the time, uh, probably still is, <laughs> um, uh, he, he is the character on Seinfeld. And people, a lot of people have read this. They've seen it in, in articles or other people, other comics have talked about it. And the truth is, that's really who he was. Larry was a lovable schlemiel that everything that could happen bad to someone happened to him. 
Uh, he wore an old army jacket and jeans and, and torn Kent sneakers. That was the extent of his wardrobe. Uh, you know, I don't think he ever made more than a few thousand dollars a year uh, before Seinfeld. And, you know, we all, when Larry would go on stage in the 70s and in the early 80s, before he got some notoriety, the, jo the inside joke among comedians was that his closing line was, fuck you. <laughs> because he would get so upset at the audience that he would eventually just say, fuck you, throw down the mic and walk off stage. Because the audiences didn't get him. Now, the comics and me having a comics kind of sensibility, we were in the back of the room cracking up because we got him and we appreciated the creative you know, mind that went on to become a, a superstar. But the audiences just stared and stared and stared at him. And uh, my, my, my two stories about that is that one time I happened to be walking towards the main room at the improv. Yeah. And these, th those, those doors came flying open and this really tall guy with a big head of hair, uh, he's in a sweat, his clothing is soaked. And you know that mirror on the way in, the mirror on the left, he looks into that mirror and starts cursing and, and, and just, you know, just ranting and raving. And I didn't know who that was. I never saw him. I didn't know anything about him. He wasn't famous. He wasn't the person that we know today, but it was Larry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that was probably more the norm than the exception. Now, he was also a great guy. I love Larry David. Right. Um, you know, because he doesn't have a big head. He is genuine. And um, I, I remember seeing him after Seinfeld and after he had earned the, the famous, you know, fortune that he has, uh, he was being interviewed on 60 Minutes and they asked him, you know, at one point you were a struggling comic and then a struggling writer. And then the show goes on the air and within a few years, you're, you're multi, multi-millionaire. What is it like to go so quickly from nothing to being so rich? And Larry had a great answer. He said, you know, my head is filled with problems that I'm dealing with constantly. And, and all that did was it removed one problem, which was needing money. It just removed that problem. But that immediately, that space in my brain immediately got filled up with other things. <laughs> so he said, it didn't, it didn't relieve any stress. It just changed what I stress about. Oh, that's perfect. Isn't that? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you one other Larry story, which is a coincidence. Now, as I said, he became a family friend uh, through through the improv. But we found out later when we started trading, you know, life stories that when me and my brothers were at a camp in the mid 60s called Camp Colang in Lackawaxon, Pennsylvania. Wow. Larry was there, too. He was. Oh, one of the yeah. Wow. We, we didn't we didn't know him. He did. Or if we did, it didn't register with us because. Why would Larry David's name register? He was, he was just another kid. Um, but yeah, we went to camp with Larry. And I also found out years later, you know who Harris Pete is, I would yeah, imagine, yeah. who is um, a perennial doorman at the comedy store. And when he and I started trading life stories, we found out we were briefly on the same ice hockey team in high school. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And again, didn't know each other at the time. He was a goalie and I was a forward, but... Yeah, we were on the same team. The, wow. The so, Skateland Arrows. So my story like that is, and you'll have to watch the Marty Nadler show. Marty Nadler was my camp counselor at Camp Winston in Monticello, New York in 1958-59. He was my camp counselor. Great. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And, I also had a counselor who went on to be a William Morris agent. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the next year, Jan Murray's son, Warren Murray, who had successes out in L.A., was my camp counselor. So, wow, uh, wow. you know, who, who knew? And my and my my last little uh, Larry David story was, and we we mentioned briefly before we came on the show, Howard Allen. Well, yes. Bud assigned Howard Allen the envious job of protecting the mic. Yeah, after so he wouldn't or, ruin it. 
<laughs> when Larry David was up on stage, and I don't know how that's possible because if Larry's throwing the damn mic down and storming off the stage, I don't know You're how. Protected, it, but... yeah. I think I think the job I think the job was to stand at the side of the stage, and when you sensed he was getting ready to throw it down, to gently coax him off stage. <laughs> um, I think that that was it, or either either that or to walk up and take it from him. Well, By the way, I should tell you, Howard Allen and I were very close friends in the great 80s. Guy. Great guy. Um, lived, lived right next to each other. He sublet an apartment from me when I was working on Saturday Night Live. And then when I came back and said, I want my apartment back, he took the apartment right next door and we were very close. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. And he was one of the first people that came on the show. And uh, uh, Oh, I'll have to go and watch that one. I didn't really yeah, know yeah, he, he had him on. And, you know, he, he, he would tell you plenty of Bud stories. Yeah. And I'll tell you another Larry David story that, again, it, it's in all the literature. People know this, but I am here to tell you that it's true. I'm sorry, my, my headset keeps popping out. Um, I worked on SNL uh, as a writer at the same time that Larry David was a writer on the 84-85 season, the season with Billy Crystal and Marty Short and Harry Scherr and Christopher Guest. And it is true that in the entirety of that season, Larry got only one sketch on the air. <laughs> The entirety of that season, he would write sketches just like everybody else week after week. And again, the writers loved his stuff because they were very, very moody. They, they, they were character driven. They weren't silly. They were they had very subtle premises and the producers just wouldn't put them in or they would slot it in the show in the last five minute segment and it would inevitably get bumped because the show would run long. And one week, this is very true, Larry got so upset that his piece got cut between dress and air that he quit. He told Dick Ebersole, the executive producer, fuck you, I'm out of here, I don't need this. And he, he left 30 Rock and starts walking home. He lived in, in Hell's Kitchen at the time. And the story that he told us later is He's walking home that night and he goes, oh my God, what have I done? I just threw away a job that was paying my rent and basically paying for me to be alive. And I, I, what have I done? What are, you know, I, I let my temper get the better of me and I did something stupid. So he came up with this plan to just show up at work on Monday <laughs> as if nothing had happened. And so the writers come in on Monday and like any place, you know, you they, it's gossip. Hey, did you hear what happened with Larry? He quit. He quit on Friday. What? Larry quit? I, oh, shit. What happened? You know? So we all go into the room with the host that week. And I forget who the host was. But at about one o'clock in the afternoon, we always had a meeting with the host. So we all go into the uh, Dick Ebersole's office and you're, everybody takes a seat around the room. And all of a sudden, Larry walks in and sits down. And everybody's <laughs> kind of like looking around like, didn't you tell me he quit? You know, and everybody's like whispering to each other. Did you say? He... And and he just sat there, and he never said anything, and Dick never said anything, and he was just back. He was just back. <laughs> and he great, he famously used that story. That was a George story on Seinfeld. Oh my God, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And I'll tell you another thing. Uh, uh, there's another episode of Seinfeld where Elaine wears, I think, a Yankees hat to a Mets game or something <laughs> like that, and gets a lot of shit. That happened. It was Larry and Bobby at a uh, Mets game, and Bobby was wearing a Giants hat or a Yankees game, one of the two. And Bobby was wearing a, a San Francisco Giants hat, and that really happened. That people started yelling at him, and he almost got into a fight with somebody because they resented the hat. And wow. Larry used that story. Wow! Wow! Yeah, you, you can't make these things up, especially when it comes to comedians. And no, the good thing is, if you hang around comedians, you don't have to make anything up. You just you just uh, take their lives and transcribe them. Well, that should be a complete and unbelievable inspiration to anyone to hear what a failure Larry David was in so many ways. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I even heard, and I don't know that this is, I don't know this to be true, but I heard that he was hired to write a freelance episode of the It's Gary Shandling show. And they disliked it so much that they wouldn't produce it. Now, he and Alan Zweibel, the executive producer of that show, along with Gary, uh, Larry and and uh, and um, 
Zweibel, Alan Zweibel, eventually became very close and Zweibel has worked on his other shows with him. But I think that there was a, some tension there when they wouldn't produce his episode. So imagine, you know, going year after year after year and your friends are succeeding and making some headway and, you know, you just don't fit in because your, your thinking is so odd and so different. Right. This should be a learning lesson to anyone not to stop because you're different. As a matter of fact, that's what's possibly going to create your future success. And it's obviously exactly what happened. Can you, I know I want to get back to the improv in the early sure. 80s when sure. you and I were hanging around together and mentioned some of the other guys, but let's just stay on this rift a little bit. Can you just trace how that initial success started to happen for him? Because you remember, Kevin, we would sit around at the improv and talk about doing a show about comedians backstage. I mean, we all, we yeah. all talked about that. We all thought, wouldn't it be funny to do a show yeah. about comedians, yeah. uh, I mean, what, they, what they do after the show? So yeah. how, did, how did Larry get to start to have some success? Well, first of all, how did I become Larry David's biographer? That's what I, want to know. <laughs> I feel like Theodore White, the making of a comedian here. Um, but I'd be happy to answer that question. So Larry, uh, you know, started as a really struggling comedian. And then, he, you know, he, along with Bobby and, and John and some of the other guys, started doing colleges and, and, and other paid gigs and again, you do something enough, you get at least competent at it. And that's the kind of comic that I was. I was never going to be a good stand-up, but I was competent at it, um, at least as a club comic. But anyways, getting back to Larry, he got hired in 1979 to be a cast member and a writer, but primarily a cast member on the show Fridays. Right. And I think that he, his confidence grew quite a bit on that show. And he was quite funny, um, coincidentally, not because of my relationship with him, but coincidentally, I was hired to be a writer on their second season oh, great. And, worked, and worked with him there as well. So Larry and I worked on two shows together, totally coincidental. Um, and so you, you, you saw the evolution of his, of his sense of humor and his onstage persona, certainly during the Friday's years. And he was also forced, because when you're, a, you're um, a cast member on a sketch show, you can't just be yourself. You've got to be able to perform in, in sketches where you're a supporting person, you're playing straight, you're playing, you're doing impressions that you never thought you could do. So, I mean, I remember I wrote a Star Wars sketch and Larry had to play the Harrison Ford character. <laughs> so when, you know, when you're forced to do things like that, you just get stronger at it. Um, then I know that he started um, writing, you know, long form things, screenplays. I know he optioned one or two screenplays. Uh, so I, I, I think that the genius that became the Larry David that we know now, that was all just an incubation period. But again, I almost feel presumptuous to talk about it because it's not my life. Right. And I thank you for filling us in on that. I appreciate that. Let's talk about, I got there in 81. And, you know, it was a bunch of us hanging out there uh, literally every night. If it wasn't every other night, it was every other night because we that was our lives. It's not yes. that we didn't have lives. That was our lives. And we were thrilled to be there. Well, it was like Cheers, except there was a comedy room next door. That was the only difference. Now, we didn't sit at the bar, but the same regulars were in that club every night. And because we were all young and single, that's where we hung out. And, and you didn't go there at 7.30 at night. I didn't get in my car until 9.30 or 10 at night to go over to the improv. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this the other night, Bruce, after I watched your podcast. You know, you think about how many people anyone meets in a lifetime. If you're lucky enough like us, I'm in my mid-60s. I think you're a few years senior to me. You, you know, if you go out in a, in a given day, you deal with a waitress, you deal with a bus driver, you deal with people at work, you know, what, whatever it is, you're paying bills at some, you know, uh, uh, Time Warner, you interact with maybe 10 or 20 different human beings a day, you know, times 365, 
times the 60 some, some odd years that we've gotten on this planet, in time spent with those people, how do they rank? And I figure you and I, we're probably in each other's top two or 300 because for that 10 to 12 year period, I saw you four or five nights a week, sat at the same table with you, shot the, you know, what with each other. And until two nights ago, when I watched your podcast, I had no idea what you do. <laughs> I still don't know what I do. <laughs> you were just Bruce Starr to me. And I knew you, you were involved in the business, but I never quite knew that you were a booker. <laughs> so I was, it was always behind the scenes for me, just, uh, sitting going into the back room when uh, you and the guys would come on and just watching and i was never much of a i wasn't a big mouth it wasn't a show off no, you, but you were just one of the guys nobody thought any less of you because you were a, 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 an act you were you were one of the guys that hung out at, at the round table or whatever table we were at and you mentioned some of the names reback and smirt off and uh uh you know we, goldstein I mean, we just, goldstein who's no longer with us we could go down the list and, and we were just a group of friends who met in one place every night. And, you know, one of the observations that I made is everyone thinks that their era was the golden era and everyone is right because it was the golden era for them. Um, but that, you know, the late seventies, early eighties, I was there for the comedy strike of 79. Uh, I was one of the first MCs at the improv to get paid. I, I actually convinced Bud to up the payment for the cut for the MCs because at one point I, I don't have the exact numbers in my head but I'm going to approximate I'm ten to fifteen dollars the acts were getting twenty five dollars and the the MC was getting seven bucks I think <laughs> and and no one had the the balls to go up to Bud and say anything but it was just ridiculous because the acts came in and out they were gone in twenty minutes. We had to stay from 8, 8, 8, 8 p.m. to 2, 2 a.m. And I actually sat down with Bud and said, Bud, if you think about it, you know, we're, we're here. It's like a dollar an hour. <laughs> I said, can you do better? And he and he raised the uh, the MC rate. I don't remember exactly to what, but he raised it off of that conversation. Well, the guys owe you uh, many thanks. About 10 bucks each. And <laughs> The clarity for you to be able to say, and not in a threatening way, you know, Bud, you know, we're there for like 10 hours. <laughs> well, that was the other thing is, is, you know, whereas Mitzi could be, you know, obviously everybody knows she had her pets. And I don't say that in a derogatory way, but there were comics who were very close to Mitzi and people who weren't in that little clique could be very intimidated by her. There were people that were intimidated by Bud, and I never understood why, because Bud sat at that table with us too, and he joked with us just like everybody else. And yes, he would say, Kevin, get out of the aisles, or he would make some little sarcastic dig, but it was never with any malice. He was just such a great guy, and is a great guy. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, he's lost some of his health and, uh, yes. and struggling right now. I would have loved to have had him come on the show, but if you look back on my webpage, You'll see a discussion and a talk that I had with Mark Linnell a couple of years back. Yeah. Now, and Mark, I was intimidated by. <laughs> and I still am. <laughs> Mark scared the shit out of me. And he still does. <laughs> and we're Facebook friends and we, we see politics. I, I, he's a little bit more liberal than I am. Excuse me. But, uh, but we talk politics on Facebook all the time. But he's still Mark to me. And, and yeah, he scared the living daylights out of me. Well, for those of the people that don't know, you know, Bud opened up the improv in Manhattan with his wife, Silver. And Silver is 95 years old. I had Zoe on the show. I yes. said, Zoe, can we get can we get Silver on the show? She said, oh, she would she would love she loves to talk. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to work that out. I would love to get yeah. Silver on the show. But, yeah. you know, uh, that story I'm reading the improv. I'm reading the Bud's book right now absolutely fascinating you're of course you're you're i think you're in it too aren't you you're in it i didn't know you wrote a book but that's what i'm doing tomorrow i'm going on to amazon and, and getting a copy absolutely it's fantastic i wish i had it by my side your 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 brother is in it all the time uh because you know he was there so early on in the early days in the 70s but so Bud, for people, you know, I've never really explained this before. Why don't you uh, do it rather than me talk about the early days 
of the improv and what that was like way before you and I even knew what was going on in Manhattan. Sure. Well, in the 60s, Bud was an impresario. Did I use that word correctly? That's pretty good. Pretty close. Okay, whatever it was, he owned a club called the, that he called the Improvisation Cafe. And in the, you know, I think it started around 63, 64. I'm not exactly sure of the dates, but uh, it was more of a variety show that he put on with comics and also singers. And famously, Bette Midler was one of the singers there. Barry Manilow used to play piano for Bette Midler uh, on those nights that she was performing. And also, uh, you know, Robert Klein and um, and uh, Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor, and and um, I can't believe I'm blanking on these names now. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield and 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 uh, David Brenner. These guys were all regulars in the '60s, and they built up the improv to the point where when Bobby became an act there, um, it already had quite a bit of cachet, and people had gone to the Tonight Show out of the improv. So he had this thriving business on 44th and 9th in Manhattan. Great club, great room, a uh, fun place to hang out, great room to work. They had a great stage. And I remember seeing Andy Kaufman when he was experimenting with things that we now take for granted. Um, when he was doing um, Tony Clifton, before Tony Clifton was this wild character that he became, it was just Andy looking like Andy acting like a real asshole. And that was Tony Clifton. Wow. And, and they would let him, interestingly, they never said like, well, this act is more of an MC because he's more like a, a Johnny Carson or the, they would let anybody MC the show. So Barry Diamond would go up there and he's doing his drugged out street urchin character <laughs> between acts. And he talked about that on your podcast where he would go on for 20 minutes talking about how Bud found him in a box <laughs> and brought him inside and gave him a roast beef sandwich. And he would do this whole bit about getting a roast beef sandwich from Bud Friedman. And people didn't know whether they were coming or going. Well, the same with Andy Kaufman. He would MC, and Andy's thing was to try to piss off the audience as much as possible. I can't imagine him MCing. I'm so surprised that they yes. actually had him MC. I can't, I can't visualize that. And I remember one night distinctly, he's in a suit, he's emceeing as I think Tony Clifton, but the character at that point was, the backstory was he was the son of a mafia guy. And this guy had put pressure on Bud to let him, you know, be an act there. So <laughs> even though he was not funny, you know, Bud had to let him on. And he would do these bits where he would bring two or three people up on stage and ostensibly they're coming up to like sing a song or something. And then someone would screw up and he would throw water on them and then they would try to take a swing at him. Well, quite often that was Bob Zamuda, who was a plant. Sometimes it was a real person. But this one night I remember, um, and my, I, re, I remember it specifically because specifically my cousin came down and she was trying to talk to Andy outside while the other acts were on and Andy wouldn't break character. Ah, I know, love that. Famously, love would that. not come out of character. And... And people took him seriously. Now, those of us who were there often enough, you know it's a you know it's a put on because you see it over and over again. But this one night, he did something that he went on to do many times. But it was one of my favorite things. He, someone came off stage and he said, "You know this this crowd. You're really you're, uh, frankly, I'm a little disappointed. So, I, I think what you need is a little education. So I'm going to read The Great Gatsby to you." Now, uh. It may have been great expectations. Maybe it was great expectations. And Andy opens up this hardcover book to chapter one and starts reading. Uh, and Bruce, I'm not talking about a couple of sentences. I'm not talking about a paragraph. I'm not talking about a page. Andy reads two or three or four pages. <laughs> Regular pace, you know, like he's an English teacher. And you have guys in the audience who are dropping big money. They're out on a date. They're trying to impress either their girlfriend or their wives. And they wanted to kill him. Yeah. You guys get, they're yelling, get the fuck off the stage, you fucking asshole, yeah. while he's doing this. And Andy's just reading and he'd glance, glance up at someone <laughs> and then go back to reading. And then in the most perfectly timed delivery I've ever experienced, 
At one point, he's about three, four, five pages in. He just looks up at the audience. I wish I had a book next to me. I'm just going to pick up some papers. He just looks up at the audience. They've been screaming at him. He stares them down. and he, you know, This is a 450-page book. He goes, we have this far, far to go, people. <laughs> He just flips through the pages. And at that point, the audience explodes in laughter. <laughs> and the reveal was there. Now, I don't know whether Andy re- wanted to reveal it, but that's how it played. And again, I, I envision it as I as clearly as I'm talking to you now. You know, Billy was on a, a month ago, and he said that he went down with... Uh, one of the older guys, big, big time comedian. I'll think of his name by the time the story's over, I hope. And they went over to... Uh, Freddie Roman. Freddie, thank you. Yeah. And he went over to the, to the deli for late night. And uh, who's in there? Andy. With a bib Bus- on. Bussing tables. Bussing tables. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was... During Taxi. Jer- so. Jerry's Deli in Studio City, early 80s. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> he didn't have to be there, in other words. Oh, no. No, he did it as a... He, Andy had a mind. He loved to just mess with people's heads. He so loved he, it. You, you know the way Billy is. Billy can be a little, you know, rough around the edges. So He says, he looks up at... <laughs> He looks up at Andy and says, "No, Andy, it's it's me and and, and Freddie." He goes, "He would. <laughs> what, what can I get you?" Yeah, yeah. There's no way if he, he was in character. I don't you know you. Him. You couldn't break him. No, he wouldn't smile. He wouldn't wink. Nothing. Nothing. Never let up the whole time. And, and Billy Rebecca is saying, "Come on, you know." And, oh, it's just. Yeah. It's, it's and, and so when I, so I get to, to Los Angeles, August of 1978, and I had already done a little stand up. You know, I had started out writing for Bobby and I would be, you know, very excited to see my stuff in his act. But then, you know, you're siblings and you've got sibling rivalry going. And sometimes I would write a lot of stuff for him and he'd say it wouldn't work. I'm not going to try it. And we would argue over it. And then at a certain point, I said, well, if you're not going to do it, I'll do it. And I started doing coffee houses. And then while I was still in college, I started doing the clubs in New York and actually became a regular at uh, the comic strip in the improv. Um, not a heavy regular, but good enough to that they would let me go on after midnight or 1 a.m. And uh, so I got the bug at that time. Now, you, you said early on you wanted to know how people got into the business, how they made that transition. So I'm going to share my story with you. Uh, I'm in college and I I was never a funny kid. I mean, I'm not sure that I'm funny now, but I was never, I was a, I was a nerd. I was the person that people beat up and, and, you know, and put his head in the, in the, the, never figuratively, but, or literally, but figuratively put my head in the toilet. But, um, but I had two things in my life that I could do better than most people. One was ice skate and play ice hockey. I don't know how, but I just learned to do that at an early age. I loved it. I used to play too. Oh, really? Oh, okay, great. So uh, did you play pond hockey? Oh, yeah. Everything. I used to, even in the rinks, we had the Murray skating rink in Westchester here. And I put on the goalie pad several times. So I know what you're talking about. And and I'll tell you one quick story. I went up to Northeastern University in Boston because I wanted to be, I wanted to play hockey up there. And I was great. On the, uh, on the gym floor, going through the exercises. And then when we got on the ice, the Canadians, zoom, zoom, oh, yes. zoom. <laughs> yes. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, Bruce, you and I lived the same life in that regard. I know what you're, exactly what you're talking about. So, um, so I was, uh, you know, uh, I, if my school had had a hockey team, I would have been a varsity athlete in high school. They have one now, but they didn't back then. So I was just a guy that everybody knew on the pond. I was you know, one of the first people you wanted to pick for a pickup game. And I played on some rink teams and then that's where I met, uh, didn't meet, but that's where I played with Harris. But, um, and the other thing that I learned to do was, was write these jokes that my brother would use in his act. And I would tell my friends, my brother's 
going to be on the Merv Griffin show. And that was like a big deal and everything. Wow. So now a quick word from one of our sponsors. Hey, gang, I've been told by a lot of the comedians I knew and represented during the 80s. I look the same as I did 40 years ago. And come to think of it, I still have my thick brown hair and just a few wrinkles. But most importantly for me, by simply applying the completely safe human growth hormone homeopathic gel on my skin just two times a day, the depression and panic attacks I suffered from years ago were gone in just two weeks. And then I started deep sleeping for many hours at night. You know, you can have the gel work for you too. To find out more, contact me at Bruce at BruceStarProductions.com. Another thing that I loved was Saturday Night Live. I mean, I loved Laugh-In and I remember watching Laugh-In with my father and I loved Carol Burnett. And I loved listening to National Lampoon Radio Hour when I was in high school and I would just listen to that in my room. And when SNL came on, and I, I knew about SNL before it came on the air because people were talking about it in the clubs in the summer of 75. And I knew Alan's wife, Bell had been hired as a writer. And I knew that they were using this other team, Franken and Davis, were going to be doing something on the show. So when it came on the air, that was really exciting for me. And I loved watching it. Now, that, that wasn't unique. There were millions of people that loved watching it. But when I was in college, um, you will remember this. SNL was so sub subversive and controversial in its first couple of years that some stations around the country would not play it. Even though it was on NBC, they wouldn't carry it. And Albany, which is where I went to school, the State University of New York in Albany, was one of those cities that didn't get it. Wow. So to see SNL, everybody had to go up to the top of the dorm tower and, and rig a, a makeshift antenna that was long enough that we could get it from Troy or, or wow. another city. Wow. And so what you would have on a Saturday night was, a, you know, a couple of hundred people, the people that didn't have sex lives, were all at 1130 on a Saturday night up at the top of the tower to watch Saturday Night Live. Wow. So one night the show is playing and the, the end credits start to roll. And you know, I would always watch the writer's credits because even back then I was, for some reason, focused on that. And I see Alan Zweibel's name. Now, Alan Zweibel was one of these comics that we talked about at the Improv who got a job as a writer on that show. And of course, is, has become a fabulously successful writer. I see his, his name going on screen and I yell, Alan Zweibel, I know that guy. And across the room, there's another guy who at the same moment goes, Alan Zweibel, I know that guy. And we look at each other. And so it was like, Love at first sight. And we walk across the room and introduce ourselves. It turns out I knew Alan from the improv and Mark Rappaport, this other person, knew Alan from uh, Rockland County where they both grew up in the same town. Well, Mark was like me. He was also a comedy nerd and he was producing and writing a radio show for the college station called No Soap Radio. It was a half an hour kind of soap opera comedy. And he invited me to join the writing staff. So I started writing formally for the college radio station. And then in my senior year, Mark is a year or two younger than me, but in my senior year, the two of us became roommates and we were co-hosting and co-writing a sketch comedy show on the college radio station. Wow. So we were a little bit well-known there because we did some controversial, i.e. tasteless stuff. That, uh, that got uh, some notoriety, not good notoriety, but got some notoriety on campus. And people would actually recognize my, my voice. And because we once did something that was and is a misogynistic sketch, but we did it and, and we caught some flack for it. And people would, yeah, you asshole, you hate women. So I would get that from the people serving me my food. God knows what was in my food uh, <laughs> when they saw me coming down the line. But um, so cut to, I'm studying business administration. Now I've got two brothers who were going into the legal profession. One who was already uh, an assistant district attorney in New York. That's my oldest brother, Bruce. And my brother, Mike, was in law school at the time. And I, so I didn't think I wanted to go to law school because I didn't want to try to kind of follow in their footsteps. Um, I didn't know why I was studying business administration. I just had to pick a major 
And uh, when the time came, that was all I could think of. Like most people, I think you're, that's what we did. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't going to be a, a literature major because I hated reading books, you know, and I wasn't uh, going to be a psychology major, although I think I would have been a good psychologist. So uh, about two months before I was supposed to graduate, I see that there's going to be a seminar on campus about how to get your first job. And a guy who had written at that time a best selling book about the job search process was hosting this, this seminar. So I go to it. There's a couple hundred people in a big lecture hall. And this gentleman starts out by saying, I want everybody to take out a piece of paper. And I want you to write down the numbers one, two, and three. And next to number one, I want you to write down if you could be anything in the world, what you would be. And then number two, your second choice, and number three, your third choice. Now, Bruce, what did I tell you that I love other than comedy writing? Hockey. Hockey. So what did I put down as number one? Hockey, Hockey player. player. Right. Number two, I put down comedy writer. And number three, I put down news producer because at that point in time, I had a, an internship at the local news station and I was kind of already interested in that. So the guy says, I want you to cross out numbers two and three. Ooh. Look at number one. And we're going to spend the next two hours focusing on how you can become that. I remember him doing this to the crowd. And I look down at number one and I see hockey player. And Bruce, you know this, but maybe the people watching can't tell. I'm lucky if I'm all of five, six and 150 pounds. Now, back then I was 120 pounds. I knew nothing he said about resumes and, and you know interviews was getting me in the NHL. So I go to number two. And, and I've told this story many times, but it's true. Bruce, you talk about an epiphany moment in someone's life. Excellent. This was like, I really felt like the house lights came down and there was just a spotlight on this piece of paper in me. And I spent the next two hours, I listened to what he had to say, but periodically looking down going, why am I going into business or marketing if I want to be a, a comedy writer? Wow. So the seminar ends. I go back to my room. Now, at this point, like I said, my friend Mark Rappaport is my roommate. And he was a theater major. And he was preparing for his finals. He had to write a trio of one-act plays. And Mark had a, um, a, a unique way of writing. He had read back then about the power of the pyramid being in the center of a pyramid, that it, it creates like a greater creative energy flow. So I walked into the room and I saw what I normally saw when I walked into my, my room in, in the dorm, which is Mark in nothing but his underpants and a paper pyramid on his head typing. Okay. And I say, Mark, I think we should write a Barney Miller script. Now, Barney Miller, as you know, a hit show in 1977, 78. And Mark says, what? And now I tell him the story of this seminar and what had happened to me there. And I, I guess I knew enough. I don't even know how I knew this, but I knew enough to know that if you wanted to be a TV writer, you had to write what they call a spec script, right. which means a sample script for an existing show. Right. I don't know how I knew that, but I knew that that was the process. So I, and I explained all this to him and I said, and I want to try the comedy writing thing. So let's write a Barney Miller script together because wow. that's my favorite show. And he said, are you out of your mind? He said, we've got finals in two months. I'm sitting here. I got to write three one act plays. I don't have time to do this. But I knew my roommate well enough to know the one way to hook him. I said, well, what if I do all the typing? <laughs> he said, okay, whatever. And so... I spent my last two months of college co-writing a Barney Miller script. Wow. <laughs> and I, and Bobby sent me a, a real Barney Miller script. So I knew the format. He got it from his agent. Wow. Uh, I wrote, we wrote this script. I did the typing, but we would bounce ideas off of each other in lines and put both of our names on it. And I sent it out to Bobby to show to some people. So Bobby showed it to his agent um, Barbara Roman, by the way, people who oh, you and I are friends with yeah. will remember Barbara's name, lovely person. And also my cousin, Steve, who at that time was a network executive 
at either NBC or, or ABC, I forget which one. And they both called me up with very nice feedback. Very nice. I was hooked. So I graduate college. Um, at that point, I'm not even thinking. I mean, I had a resume because I'd already had one made up, a nice and bust resume. And I decide I'm going to try my hand at comedy writing first. I said to myself, listen, some people take a gap year and go to Europe. I'm going to go to Los Angeles. Wow. And, and when the year is up, I'll come back and get a real job. Wow. So now, so this is now the summer of 1978. Yeah. Bruce, I had never in high school or college taken a writing class. Oh my gosh. I mean, not only didn't I read books, I had never taken a formal writing class. So I said to myself, you know, maybe before I get in the car and drive across country, I should get at least some kind of, you know, pretend education at what I want to do. So uh, I found out that the new school in New York had a class in writing movies for TV, movies of the week, wow. which don't exist anymore. Right. But in the 70s, you know, with, with Roots and what have you, that was a big, big thing. So I found out that this course was on whatever night it was, let's say Tuesday nights at seven o'clock. I go to the classroom in 1978. I just walked into the building. There's no security. There's nothing, nobody checking anything. I sit in the back of the classroom. The teacher, the first night, she reads the roster of names, goes down this whole list. People go here, here, here. At the end, she said, did I leave anybody off? She says, oh, okay, what's your name? Kevin Kelton. How do you spell that? K-E-L-T-O-N. Boom. I was in the class. <laughs> never registered, never paid. Took this eight-week class in writing uh, a, a, a TV movie. Wow. So with that, I now had my second script because I had the Barney Miller script, which I co-wrote, and this script, which I wrote by myself. And with those two scripts in hand, I get in my 1974 used uh, Ford Mustang and drive across country. Wow. And on the way across country, wrote two more scripts Whoa. You know, at night in, in the uh, in the motels that I was staying at. And but by the way, when I say motels, even that's a generous term. Very nice. uh, <laughs> flea bag should have been on the front of, uh, of, of their names. Um, I stopped one night in Columbus, Ohio, where, where Bobby was playing. Now, here's Whoa. a great story that you'll like. So Bobby did his first Tonight Show in June of 1978, wow. the same month that I was driving across country. And uh, before I, actually, he did it before I left. And uh, I remember watching it in New York with some of the other comics at the club. And, you know, pretty, pretty exciting. He had a great shot. Very exciting. And, you know, there's always that feeling of like, oh, my God, you've transcended to another level. So... I'm making this plan to drive across country. And Bobby says, well, you know, I'm going to be working in, in Columbus uh, one of the nights that you're passing through. Why don't you stop? You'll see my show. You'll stay overnight in my room, save you a couple of bucks. So I do it. So this guy had just come off of not only, you know, had he worked with Tom Jones in Vegas, but he, had, he did Griffin a lot. And he just done his first Tonight Show. We get to this club in, in, in Columbus, Ohio, huge venue, huge venue, where people, it was a, a, a dinner and a show kind of a thing. So it's tables, not just chairs. Bruce, there's one table of six people, Asian Americans, and English was not their first language. And they're there for a birthday party. <laughs> they didn't even know there was a comic that was going oh for God. And I had to watch my brother do a 40 minute set to six people who barely knew who he was in the room. Oh, my God. A week after he had done The Tonight Show. And it was humbling for him, but it taught me what a professional my brother is. Because he didn't panic. He didn't get angry. He just did his act. And they paid him for it. And that was what he was there to do. How can it have been such a disaster? I mean... Uh, Six so people, they spoke Chinese. Oh. <laughs> Wow. I mean, you know, the, 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 there's lots of stories like that, and it helps you, and you, you grow from it, and 
you know, you become more and more professional with situations like this. So I'm fascinated by your story. Let's keep going about. Yeah. And, and let me, you know, because again, some, some of what I'm here to testify to is what it's like to be the brother of a comedian and seeing the eyes through someone. I mean, seeing that business through someone else's eyes. And I'll tell you another Bobby story, another thing that impressed me about him. And by the way, I'm not, you know, Google-eyed about you know, my brother's career. I, I know what his successes were and what, you know, why he never got to be bigger than he got to be. But Bobby is a consummate professional. And another thing I remember is one night we drive into the city, you know, our, our parents' home, our home was in Rockville Center, Long Island, and we would drive into Manhattan. And Bobby, you know, parks the car someplace on God knows what street it was. And we walk over to Catch a Rising Star and he does his set. And then we go back to get into the car to go over to the improv for his second set of the night. Car's not there. Oh, look all over. Car's not there. Well, we figured out we parked illegally and he'd been towed. Yeah. Okay. So the car is now in some lot. They want a lot of money to get it out. And Bobby has a set at the improv. Actually, I think I got it mistaken. He did the improv first and then he went to catch. And so we get to catch and he is pissed. He is, every other word is, is F. Um, and I'm thinking this is going to be a disaster. And then, you know, uh, whoever the MC was, whether it was Bob Shore or whether, whether it was, uh, uh, what's his name? You know, now coming to the stage, very funny guy. You might've seen him on the Tonight Show, Bobby Kelton. And he walks up there and he does one of the best sets he ever did. That is focus and dedication. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Your next step. What happened with you? So when I went, you know, I drove across country to become a writer because I, I knew that I wasn't going to be Jay Leno. I just you know, knew I didn't have that in me. But I also knew that I could use stand up to showcase some of my lines. So I start doing stand up out here, excuse me, out here in Los Angeles <clears throat> as a way to showcase my material and sell lines. And I sold lines to Dreesen. I sold lines to Joan Rivers. I remember going to uh, the Horn in Santa Monica and watching Joan do my material. Um, uh, I almost sold a joke to, to Letterman, but we couldn't agree on a price, um, believe it or not. Uh, and a few other people. But I knew I, I was trying to become a television writer. So in 79, one of my best friends was a comic that, again, you may remember, and hopefully your audience will remember too. He's no longer with us. Bob Schimmel, Robert Schimmel, yeah. was a very close friend of mine. And we hung out all the time. Now, back then, Bob and I were both just newcomer comics. We had already passed auditions, but we were still not headliners. You know, we were still lucky to get a spot on a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. And Bob was very straight laced back then. He hadn't found his niche yet, which was working dirty. <laughs> But uh, because he became a brilliant monologist when he realized that he was such a meek looking guy and when he would put on a suit and tie and then go up and do the raunchiest material he could write, he became incredibly successful and brilliantly funny. But this was before he found himself. So we're hanging out and Bob says, um, hey, uh, I got this, I met a guy named Jackie Kahane. And he tells me, uh, Jackie Kahane, former stand-up comic, at that point was in his 60s. And he, his, his days as a comic were kind of winding down. So he had gotten into becoming a manager for young comedy writers. He liked young, funny people. And he figured this was a way that he could kind of transition, reinvent himself. So Jackie became a manager, and specifically of young comedy writers. So Bob Schimmel had met him and Jackie said, would you like to write some stuff and I'll represent you? And Bob said, well, I'm not truly a writer, but maybe if I found a partner and Jackie said, go ahead, find one. So Bob approaches me and I said, sure, what the hell? So Bob and I start spending our days writing spec scripts together and we wrote some stuff for, for Letterman. We wrote seven pages of, of jokes for Letterman 
and gave them to Meryl Marco, who was Letterman's both girlfriend and head writer, as you probably know. And Dave liked one joke. Oh! Actually, actually called me up and, and wanted to give us $25 for the line. Now, he had just signed a million dollar deal and was going to use the line in his Tonight Show hosting monologue. He was going to be hosting to the Tonight Show and he wanted to use it in his opening monologue. And he offered me 25 bucks. And I knew that, you know, Rodney was paying a hundred bucks a line. And uh, uh, I knew uh, other people, Jimmy Walker paid 75 bucks a line. I knew that Letterman sometimes paid 50 and 75 bucks a line because the writers talked to each other. So I said to him on the phone, I said, Dave, you know, I was hoping to get a little bit more for it. You know, there's two of us, we got to split it. It's one line. Let's, can you do 50 bucks? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know whether it's worth $50. Now, I wanted to sell the line to Letterman because he's going to do it on The Tonight Show. But I had, I had already started a negotiation. And I didn't want to just say, OK, take it for 25 bucks. I'm trying to save some semblance of my dignity here. So I said to him, look, Dave, let, I, I, I'd love to sell you the line. I appreciate the fact that you have a value that you've attached to it. Let's meet in the middle. Give me 35 bucks, which by the way, wasn't the middle. That was 10 bucks over $25. And I said, just give me 35 bucks. I got to split it with Bob anyways. And uh, we'll both go our separate ways. He says, let me think about it. I'll call you back. Calls me back 10 minutes later, goes, I just... <laughs> I don't think it's worth more than $25. <laughs> and at that point, you know, I had invested so much of my, you know, my personality into this thing, my ego. I said, you know what, Dave, at that point, I'll just do the line in my own act. So thank you anyways. Maybe we can do business in the future. I thought maybe he'd call me back and say, okay, 35 bucks. Nope. Never spoke to the man again. Great Letterman story. Wow. And years later, when I was working at SNL and he was doing Late Night with David Letterman in the same building, uh, our offices were on the 17th floor. Our studio was on the 8th floor, 8, 8H. Um, and his studio was on the 6th floor. And one weekday night, me and one of the other writers decided for whatever reason to get off at the 6th floor and just look around and see what was going on there. And I'm walking down the hall and there's Letterman dressed to do his show. And we make eye contact. And I could tell that he knew he knew me. I can't remember whether he kind of, it, he, it one of two things. He's either going, I think I know that guy, or he's going, oh, that's that asshole who tried to hold me up for that joke. <laughs> one of those two, but he didn't speak to me. I didn't speak to him. And that was the last time I had any contact with David Letterman, who, by the way, I bear no malice. He probably was right. That line probably wasn't worth more than 20 bucks. Uh, uh, uh. So yeah, so so I'm selling these jokes, and then uh, 79 December of 79, one of the comics at the store again. You may not know some of these people because they were more store comics, and you spent I think a much more time at the Improv. But a guy named Mark uh, Summers, his real name is Mark Berkowitz, but he changed it to Mark Summers for show business because David Berkowitz had kind of screwed up uh, that last name uh, yeah. in the world. So uh, Mark Summers was an act at, the, at the, the store, but he also got a lot of writing gigs, especially on game shows. And he was a very good friend of Bobby's and looked upon me again as a little brother of one of his friends. And, but he had seen my act many times and he said he liked my act. And he said, Kevin, uh, a producer contacted me from the show Crosswits. Uh, they're looking for writers. They wanted me to do it. I'm too busy. But if you'd like, I, I'll tell them about you course, please. Absolutely. Thank you. So a couple of days later, he says, here's the guy's number. He wants to hear from you. Call him. So I call this producer and we book an interview. Now I go in for the interview and, you know, drive across town, probably put on a clean shirt. I don't know. And I get there. And as soon as I walk in and we shake hands, he says, listen, I've got to tell you up front, Kevin, I'm so sorry about this. Uh, we, we made an offer to someone earlier today on the job, but you're here anyways, let's talk. Who knows, you know, what might happen in the future? 
Sure, what the hell? I'm there anyways, right? So I sit down and we start chatting and he also had a comedy background and he's going, you know, you look familiar to me. And I'm going, you know, you look familiar to me too. So we start playing Jewish geography, right? What high school did you go to? Who do you know? Blah, blah, blah. And nothing is clicking. And then he said, did you ever do the dating game? Now, as you know, Bruce, back in the early 80s or late 70s at this point, they were using comics on the dating game quite a bit because they were funny. Yeah. And I had done the dating game. Uh, when I did the dating game itself, I, I bombed. I stunk up the place. I couldn't, I couldn't make anybody laugh. But in my audition, I had a great day and I was really funny. And he said, I remember you from that audition. Wow. You were funny. And I said, thank you. And he said, you know, I, like I told you, I don't have a job for you, but I know someone else who's starting up a new game show. And I think they can use funny people. Do you want me to give them your name? And again, I said, sure. And that led to my first writing job, which was on a game show called Face the Music. It was a knockoff of Name That Tune. It was produced by the same company. Um, and the difference was on Name That Tune, you just had to name the song. On Face the Music, you had to name the song and then the song title was part of a puzzle. And usually they were kind of clever puzzles and we were hired to write these puzzles. So I got my first writing gig, it was $250 a week. We were called researchers. They wouldn't even call us writers because they wanted to get around the, the writer's guild. So they called us researchers. And that was my first TV job. And I remember calling up my parents the night I was hired and telling them that I had been hired on a TV show and I was making $250 a week. And it was one of the proudest moments of my life. Wow. Because I had actually set, on some level, succeeded on what I had set out to do. Um, but from there, I did that show for a season and a half. Uh, and, and Jackie Kahane, in the meantime, was managing Bob Schimmel and I. Okay, cut to... Bob Schimmel, you know, when we would get together and do our writing sessions, he would say, hey, I dropped the stuff off at Jackie's yesterday. He was reading it. He was laughing. Oh, and he asked me to sit down and write uh, 25 jokes for Marty Allen for a roast. So I sat down and wrote some jokes for Marty Allen, blah, blah, blah. So this was going on for a month or two or three. One day I'm at home in, in, in my apartment in Brentwood and I get a call from Jackie Kahane, who I had never spoken to. And he had, this is how he would talk. He'd go, Kevin. This is Jackie Kahane. That's, that's his voice. It's a pretty good impression. You wouldn't know that, but it's a pretty good impression. He goes, Kevin, I got a little problem. I'm hoping you can help me with it. Every week, Bob Schimmel comes into my office with pages of material that say written by Bob Schimmel and Kevin Kelton. And I'm reading them and I'm laughing. Then sometimes I ask Bob to sit down at the typewriter and write up some lines for one of my acts. And I read his stuff and I'm not laughing. <laughs> and after a couple of weeks of this, Kevin, I realized the writer that I like is not Bob Schimmel, it's Kevin Kelton. So Kevin, here's the problem. I don't wanna represent the two of you. I wanna represent you. Now I'm floored. Again, I've never even spoken to this man He's 60 years old. I'm what, all of 23, 24, 25. I said, Jackie, first of all, thank you. I'm very honored. Uh, I feel a little awkward because Bob is, is one of my best friends. Uh, but I'm, I'm also tempted. But let me talk to Bob and, and feel this out. He says, okay, get back to me. So I call up Bob. I tell him what went down. And, and he's, you know, he's a little surprised and a little hurt. And I said, the upshot is Bob, he's not gonna represent the two of us. So, you know, if, if there was a way for us to be represented by him together, that would be my first choice. But since he made it clear that he's not gonna represent us together, would you mind if I take him up on his offer to represent me? And Bob was cool about it. He said, sure, I mean, what the hell? You know, it's not gonna change my life. So Jackie became my manager and he would continue to, uh, you know, put me up for jobs. I was up for the Tonight Show, uh, didn't get it. He'd put me up for other jobs, didn't get it. But he got me Fridays. And that was my first comedy writing gig. Wow. So what was that like 
how was your interaction with those people? Were you separate from them or was there interactions? Well, you mean the cast? Or, yeah. Uh, oh, no, we weren't separate at all. When you're working on a sketch comedy show, generally you're in pretty close proximity with the cast. You don't write with them, but they have their own offices and they know that the real power on the show lies with the writers because if the writers don't write for you, you're not in the show. Right. So they're always particularly kind to you because they know on some level you hold their future in their hands. Um, so I get this job. It was produced by uh, Moffat and Lee, uh, John Moffat and Bill Lee. And Larry, again, happened to be in the cast. I don't think he had anything to do with me getting the job. Um, but I did a, you know, 12 episodes there. Uh, it was tough. It was my first real comedy writing gig, uh, making $1,000 a week, which to me back then was a lot of money. But it was very competitive. Sketch comedy, being on the staff of a sketch comedy show is cutthroat competitive. You have to write a lot of stuff and not just write a lot of stuff, but you have to get stuff in the show. And everybody knows whose stuff is in, who's getting a lot in, and who's not getting a lot in. And I got, I got four or five sketches in that run, which was okay, but not quite good enough to get picked up. Um, some of the sketches played very well, but it was, uh, it was a little too competitive for me. And, and frankly, there was also, I don't want to blame it on this because I don't take, I don't want to shift responsibility away from my lack of talent, but um, that was a big drug environment. Pot, cocaine, blah, blah, blah. And I don't do any of that stuff. And it was a little hard to fit in because it was so prevalent, especially amongst the writing staff. So you couldn't, you know, people I think felt like I was a narc in the room. And in fact, uh, a, a few, uh, last year I did another podcast uh, about comedy and I, I told some of these stories. And a couple of months later, the podcaster who had done the interview wrote to me and he said, by the way, Kevin, did you ever find out why you were not picked up at Fridays? And I said, I assumed it was because I, uh, I just didn't cut it. He said, well, I spoke to, and I won't mention the writer's name out of respect for him, another good friend of mine, not a bad guy, but he had also interviewed this other writer from Fridays. And this writer told the interviewer, Ian, that uh, Jack Burns had once told the writer that he said, one of the reasons we didn't pick up Kevin Kelton is he doesn't do drugs and I, I didn't feel comfortable around him. You know, you and I are so similar. I mean, to, 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 this is what I love about doing this show to find out the inside story and how, who Kevin is and who Bobby is and who uh, all, all these guys are, when they get a chance to talk about themselves without two or three minute sound bites, to hear that you were a hockey player back then is like, you know, blow me away because I was a whole 5'8 and 150 pounds or something, but I love the game. And you were just big enough. Pitt Martin. You were as big as Pitt Martin. To, to possibly get away with, because all the <laughs> Canadians skating circles around me yeah. were 5'8 and 160 pounds. So that yeah. didn't uh, eliminate <laughs> me. So I've said this a, a, a dozen times over the years, and people would say to me, you know, not too many people leave show business. And you know this to be true. They, they live and die in show business. Very few people live, leave. And I left. And uh, but people, w w why did you leave? I said, you know what? I didn't achieve the success that I wanted to because uh, I wasn't an alcoholic. I wasn't a drug addict. I wasn't a drug dealer. I'm not going to say some of the other ones, but I said, I didn't fit in anywhere. And it's yeah. just what you're saying. They, you need a pocket of, of dysfunction. And if you matched a pocket of dysfunction, you had a chance, whether it was snorting or smoking or drinking off to the side, bonding. I never had that. And no. like you with the improv, <laughs> we were clean and we, we weren't like that. Yeah, I'm pretty straight laced. Now, I, I have to confess, 
I won't say I have no dysfunctions because there are plenty of people who will find them. I heard about them, so let's we don't have yeah. to. <laughs> but um, but no, I was always very straight laced. In fact, when I did move out to LA before I got that uh, that before I got a job as a doorman at the comedy store just to make some money and get my own place. The first job I got, I was a bank teller. And I would go in every day and I would sit behind the, the cage and I would make change for people and, and do what bank tellers do. And I would go upstairs to the break room and write jokes during my break. And they thought I was out of my mind that I thought that I was going to become a comedy writer. But the reason I bring this up is, you know, sometimes when you're a teller, your tray is short. Sometimes it's a couple of bucks. Sometimes it's 20 or 40 or a hundred bucks. Now, my tray was virtually never short. I, I don't think I was ever short more than a handful of dollars. But I once asked the head teller, I said, uh, you know, what happened? She, she said, Kevin, no one would suspect you of stealing money. You are the last person here that we would suspect of pocketing a 20. Um, I just have that personality. People just see me as, you know, I would have been a good narc. Uh, yeah. I would have been a good cop. In fact, in, in college, I was on judicial board. Uh, and we were the Nazis that would, when, when somebody like thought it was funny to use the fire extinguisher where there wasn't a fire, we were the ones that wrote them up. And all my friends said, you're, you're, you're like a Nazi. What are you doing? You know, <laughs> but to me, this was, a, this was good fun. <laughs> so how do you so, go from the letdown? See, this is the really interesting part. You're let down, man. You're, you're under pressure. It didn't work for you. You know, a lot of comedians would say, I'm done. I'm finished. Oh, I, no, no. I don't fit into this business. You know, a lot of people would. And look, Bruce, you, you know me. You know, when it came to talking to girls, I was a basket of nerves. Uh, if I, you know, I mean, so many things in life um, I would have been nervous about. But getting on stage never made me nervous. And I never had tremendous self-doubt as a writer. I'll tell you a, a couple of other stories that you'll like. So I, I do the show Fridays and it ends. And now I'm, I'm unemployed. I might've picked up a couple of small gigs here and there, but I'm still trying to get my next big break. And I wrote actually a second spec Barney Miller script during this time. Now, one of my hobbies when I first moved to LA was I transitioned from playing hockey to coaching boys hockey in Culver City. And I'm um, coaching a 12 year old, to a Bantam team, 12, 13, 14 year olds. And one of the other coaches said to me, hey, I hear that you're, you wanna be a comedy writer. You know, one of the kids on your team, his dad manages comedy writers. Oh my God. He's, he's, he's supposedly pretty successful. And again, I won't mention his full name out of respect. His first name was Harvey, not White, not, not White. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and he says to me, uh, why don't uh, you give me your script? I'll give it to Harvey to read. So I give him this Barney Miller script. Now I had written the script with some guidance from one of the actual staff writers on Barney Miller and they liked it enough to bring me in and pitch to them. Nice, nice. And I pitched some stories, didn't sell them a story, but I went through the process. So a couple of weeks later, this guy Harvey calls me up. He says, I want you to meet me down at uh, the Santa Monica uh, um mall uh such and such a time i want to talk to you so i meet him in there at the designated time and harvey starts we're walking around and he starts asking me questions why do you want to be a comedy writer what do you want to do with your life how did you get into it where do you think you're going about 15 minutes of this and then he says there's a reason i'm asking you all these questions because i read your barney miller script very carefully and i must tell you I was not impressed. I didn't think it was funny. I don't think you got the characters. I don't think you got the show. And I really do not see a path for you in this business. Wow. And I'm only telling you this not to be mean or to hurt your feelings, but I want to save you a lot of pain and aggravation. Wow. Now, this guy was in his 40s at the time. He had some, some white hair. And I, you know, it didn't occur to me that he was being mean. I think he sincerely believed everything that came out of his mouth. But I said to him, Harvey, I'm a little, I'm a little confused. First of all, I respect what you're telling me, but with all due respect, Harvey, first of all, 
I've been paid to be a professional comedy writer. I just came off a gig where I was making $1,000 a week working for ABC. And secondly, the people at Barney Miller read this script and liked it enough to bring me in to pitch to the show. And Harvey thinks for a second, he said, did they buy anything of yours? I said, well, no, they liked one story, but it was, it was a Christmas story and they already have one for this year. And he said, excuse me, I asked you a question. Did they buy anything from you? I said, no. He said, that should tell you something. And that was the extent of our meeting. I said, well, I said, well, Harvey, I really appreciate you taking the time to read the script. And uh, I'm going to think about what you said, but frankly, uh, I think you're mistaken and I'm going to continue on my path. And I went home and I told this story to, I might've told it to you. I told it to, you know, anyone who would listen. And uh, I it didn't dissuade me. I said, he, how could he know what he's talking about? I've already been paid to write comedy. I know I am a professional comedy writer. So he can't tell me that I don't have any future at it. Now, if that had happened two years earlier, maybe I would have been put off, but luckily I'd already had some success. What happened after that? Because you got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you know, you got to prove yourself and even be even greater than you were before in your own right. mind to get that next job. Where'd that right. next job come okay. from? Okay. So then I got a job on a show called Nashville Palace, which was sort of like a, a, a step up from Hee Haw. It was produced by Dick Clark Productions, but that was a short lived job. It didn't work out. And Jackie couldn't get me the types of meetings and the types of jobs that I wanted. So um, I'd mentioned Barbara Roman before, who was Bobby's agent and who had, you know, was sort of like a big sister to me. And she said, if you want, I'll, I'll take you on uh, at Writers and Artists Agency. So I went with her and uh, she got me um, uh, Steve Martin's Twilight Theater which was a, a late night special that uh, they did a couple of that uh, went into the, the SNL slot on those weeks that SNL was dark. Right, right. I did one of those. And, you know, Bruce came on and talked about Leslie Nielsen. I'm glad I, I get to mention this. And he told you about the, the fart box that Leslie Nielsen would use. Uh -huh. Remember that story? And, and I'm here to tell you uh, it's correct. I experienced that same thing. Leslie Nielsen, one of the funniest people I've ever met on or off camera, he was the host of the show and he had this little immature thing that he would keep in his coat jacket pocket that made a farting sound. And what he loved to do when people would come up for a selfie with him, this was before cell phones, they use a camera. He would he put his arm around them, the biggest grin of the world. And he'd, he would suddenly stick his hand into the pocket and make this noise. And then his eyes so imperceptibly would just look to that person and look away. <laughs> And he did it over and over again, and we were cracking up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the level of humor that made me laugh. But uh, so I did that. I did uh, an ABC show co called, coincidentally, No Soap Radio, the same name that my college radio show had had. Um, I did that. I did a, a sketch comedy show called Laugh Tracks that Harry Ma uh, How Howie Mandel was in, and Lucy Webb and Frank Welker and uh, Gail Mathias and a few other people. And I'm trying to break into sitcoms at the same time I'm pitching to shows. Uh, but the summer of 83, Barbara says, SNL is looking for, for writers. Get me some sketches. And I did. And she says, uh, a few weeks later, she says, they read it. They kind of liked it. They'd like to talk to you on the phone. They'd like to interview, interview you over the phone because I was in Los Angeles. So I get on the phone with Dick Ebersole and Bob Tischler, the executive producer and the producer of the show. And, you know, it's a typical interview. They tell me about your life. How do you get here? Blah, blah, blah. And then they said, well, you know, we like your stuff, but we're, we're not quite convinced yet. So what we would like you to do is write us two or three more pieces and get it to us by the end of the week. Now, this is on like a Monday or a Tuesday. So they were putting, they were putting the, uh, the getting you ready for. That's exactly <laughs> right, Bruce. And I knew immediately that's what they were doing. They wanted to see if I could write under deadline because they're not idiots. They knew that that stuff was trunk stuff that I had used. So they wanted to see if I could turn out material under deadline. And I knew this. So I wrote three pieces and I wrote them and I got it to them a day or two early because I knew that that was the test. And Sure enough, they liked it, and I got the job. Were you, up all, were you up all night writing? 
I never had to, had to put that kind of pressure on myself. I was never a struggling writer. Uh, you know, obviously it, it, ideas didn't just come to me in a snap, but I just, I always had this attitude of like, I'd come up with the best idea I can. I'd write it the best I could. When I thought it was good enough, I'd show it and I let it go. And that's one of the reasons why I was able to be one of four people that worked on both Fridays and Saturday Night Live, the two live sketch comedy shows of their day, was because very few people can, can handle that pressure. Wow. What, that's, so tell me about your experience on SNL, because, you know, so, everybody, everybody knows that show. I will, but but let me let me before I get to SNL, let me tell you. So that night, I get the call in the afternoon. I'm going to be hired. They want me there next week. Now, as again, everybody will remember, SNL went through a kind of a dark phase right after the original cast left, and it lost quite a lot of its cachet. But over the year or two, 1981, 82, 1982, 83, with Eddie and uh, and um, Joe Piscopo leading the cast and Dick Ebersole running the show, it started to build up its reputation again. So I get the job, but to me, you know, I'd already worked on Fridays and Laugh Tracks. and To me, I, I got a job in New York. I didn't think it was that big a deal anymore. I didn't, SNL wasn't the SNL of the 70s. But it wasn't until I got to the improv that night and I started telling people, yeah, I got a job today. I'm going to be going to New York working on Saturday Night Live. And people were like, what? You're going to... And again, you might've been one of the people who, who remembers, but I remember telling Bud and a couple of other, and they're going, wait, you're, you're going to be ready for Saturday Night Live? And that was when it first clicked at me that this was a bigger deal than I thought it was. <laughs> that day, I was just kind of like, oh, I got another job. So I go to SNL and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm the new kid in town. It's, uh, it's tricky at first. I, I, I got a lot of sketches in, in the first five shows, I got five sketches in, in the first five shows, which is pretty good because they have very large writing staffs. And then I hit a slow patch where all I was getting in was some news jokes uh, in, in the, the SNL news. Like they didn't call it weekend update back then they called it SNL news. Um, and then toward the end, I, I got a, a, some pieces back in, but I was, um, it was a great season you know, wrote a Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood, wrote one or two other things that Eddie appeared in as just a, a character, um, wrote, you know, some sketches that were well-received, but I wasn't, you know, you know, I was hitting 265, you know, I wasn't killing the ball. And so um, the season ends and I, I came back to LA. I had a sublet in New York that was my brother Mike's apartment that he had just moved out of. And, and that was turning condo. So I lost my New York apartment. I'm back in LA. And in television, they have a certain period of time in which to renew your contract. And for me on SNL, it was June 1st of the summer. And so I get a call on June 1st. My agent calls me and says, um, Dick and Bob are going to call you up. They want to talk to you about the contract. Okay. So again, it's it's, you know, Fisher cut bait day. And I get a call from the producers and they say, um, Kevin, look, here, here's what's going on. Uh, the show almost didn't get picked up by NBC. And we had to do a lot of work to convince Brandon to keep it on the air. And, and part of that is we're bringing in a lot of new talent next year. Uh, uh, we're going to be, you know, Eddie's gone, but we're bringing in Billy Crystal and Marty Short and Christopher Guest, maybe you know that name. Of course I knew who Christopher Guest was. And Harry Shearer. And, and they, they tell me the rest of the cast that they're bringing in. Rich Hall. They said, we think it's very exciting. However, you know, we, we still have a budget. And uh, we have a lot of blood on our hands today, Kevin. We have a lot of blood on our hands, which meant that they had to let a lot of people go to make room for those people. And they said... And we're, we're also looking at some new writers. And if we had to give you an answer today, that answer will be no. But if you can give us another couple of weeks and let us really take a look at the budget, let us see what we can do. So it's your choice. It's either answer today and the answer is no, or extend your, your option period for another four or five weeks. 
I said, sure, what the hell? I'm not going any place. Guys, take how long, you, however long you like. I don't care if you call me in September. I don't. <laughs> so they were, I think they were very pleased that I took that tact. And three weeks later, they called me and picked me up and, and thanked me for giving them the flexibility that they needed. Great story. So, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, when I went back that second year, and I know we're not talking about the improv anymore, but I think oh, a lot okay. of comedy people will be interested in this. That second year, it just started to click for me. And I just started getting material in. I also started uh, developing relationships with the other writers. And sometimes we would write together. Now, when you wrote with, with one or two other writers, you had to double or triple your output. You couldn't just write the same amount of stuff but they would allow you to work with other writers as long as the output was there. And I started working with two other guys and we just clicked as a, as a three person team. And we were getting two sketches in a show, which was pretty good. Um, so I got a lot of material in that, that second season um, and, and a lot of stuff that I'm very proud of. Uh, I don't know how much of, a, of an SNL aficionado you were back then, but I wrote, uh, you know, we t together, the three of us wrote the first draft theater sketches. That was a series of sketches that ran uh, with the premise being that with the first draft or something that went on to be really successful once it was polished. Um, I wrote um, uh, the high school chess coach that Jim Belushi did, which was what if the uh, high school had a chess coach and he was like Bobby Knight and he was cursing and throwing things. And, and stuff like that. That that piece played very well and, and is very well re remembered. Um, I wrote, uh, Billy Crystal did a Prince impression. And in 1985, the We Are the World video and, and song came out. And again, maybe you'll remember this, Bruce. A obviously, most of the, the celebrities in the music world were there, but there were a couple of people that didn't get into We Are the World. Cindy Lauper uh, did, but, but Madonna didn't get in even though they were both around the same level at that time. And another famously absent face was Prince. And what really happened was Prince just didn't like the idea of sharing the stage with anybody else. But his cover story was that he couldn't make the recording session because his, his bodyguards had gotten into a fight at a bar and he had to go bail them out. That was the story that was in the papers as to why Prince wasn't there. So I read that and I thought, well, Prince, he's got a pretty, pretty much a pretty big ego. I wouldn't be surprised if he did his own video called I Am Also the World. <laughs> so I wrote a song using the, the tune from We Are the World called I Am Also the World. And I wrote this sketch and Billy performed in it. And, and that played pretty well too. So I had, you know, these are things that I remember. Obviously there, I had 35 sketches in that year, but uh, those are the ones that I'm most proud of. Wow. Great, great, great story. You know, uh, I can go on with you all day. <laughs> is, is there anything else that you have not told us that you want to share before we, you know, say, say goodbye? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, we've only scratched the surface of my writing career, but who cares about that? But I just want to say that those days hanging out and you talked about Billy Reback. Uh, he was part of our clan and actually Billy and I tried to create a show for Bruce Smirnoff. Um, in the, uh, the the late '90s of the in the early teen, the early 2000s, I don't wow. remember. And we we pitched it at a couple of networks, and it was basically we, we wanted to take Bruce's one act play, which you've seen, unbelievable, unbelievable, and we wanted to take that character and and build a Seinfeld esque kind of a show around him. Um, and Billy and I, you know, came up with the the premise and the treatment, and and we pitched this thing. But those days. And again, everybody thinks their era was the golden era and, and everyone's right. There are people today that think they're in the golden era of comedy. But those days hanging out with you and, 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 and Mark Goldstein and, and Barry Rabinowitz, who was another writer. And oh, my stage, God. And Kevin Rooney, oh, who yeah. was still kicking. And, and oh, the, I got to end with the Rich Scheidner story. I, there was a story I wanted to tell you. And this is the perfect story to close with. And I know we're going long. Well, one of the things that I got into, because I couldn't play hockey as an adult, and everybody needs some kind of an exercise. In the early 80s, I started studying karate. And it's become a big part of my life. I, I'm still involved in it to this day. But in 1987, the day after the stock market crashed, I was working on a show 
at uh, Gower Gulch on on Sunset. Right, right. Uh, I was working on a sitcom called Women in Prison for Fox. But anyways, that's not important. Uh, for my afternoon lunch, I walked across the street to the Five and Dime store there to get the New York Times to read about the stock market crashing the day before, because I had personally lost $15,000, which was a lot of money back then. So I get the New York Times and I'm walking back towards the studio. And as I'm crossing the street, I see a, a skirmish start to break out in the street between a driver and two other guys. And I look closely and the driver is Rich Scheidner. <laughs> And Rich had gotten into some kind of an altercation with a guy who was the valet at the Columbia Bar and Grill. And as we later found out, this guy's cousin who was just hanging out with him. We didn't know this at the time who was who. All I know is I'm walking down the street and I see Rich Scheidner, who I know from the improv. And, you know, we weren't friends. We never went out for coffee, but I know the man. And he's getting the shit kicked out of him by two people, right? And I'm a, a brown belt in karate at that point. And so I figure I can't just walk away, right? I'm seeing a, a person I know is getting beaten up. So first I, I'm, I'm trying to break it up from a distance. I'm about 20, 30 feet away. And I'm going, Rich, Rich, man, get back in the car, man. Get back in the car. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And at one point he tried to get back in the car. And then one of these jerks ripped his, uh, his antenna off his car. And Rich gets out of the car to get his antenna back. And this guy starts beating him with the antenna. Now the, the two of them are really, they've got him against the car and they're pummeling him. Oh my God. So uh, Kevin, you, you, it, this is it. You got to do something. So I, I pull one of the guys off because I figure if I can take one of them off of him, Rich is a big guy and a tough guy. He can handle himself in a one-on-one. So I pull one of the guys off and I swing him around. And I knew enough of how to kind of like lock arms. So somebody, you know, and we we both got each other by the, the, the lapels and, and I'm yelling, calm down, man. It's over. It's over. Calm down, calm down. And the son of a bitch, he snuck his arm out and he pops me in the right ear. And that's it. Well, I started going ape shit on this guy and I'm hitting him and he's trying to hit me and he's trying to choke me and I'm kicking his leg and everything. Finally, some other people from the Columbia Bar and Grill come out and break us up. And, uh, and they say, uh, you got a little, you got a little, I had like a very tiny little scratch right here. They say, why don't you go inside and clean yourself up? I go into the bathroom and put a little water on it. I come back outside, get to the street, pick up my newspaper. And as I'm trying to cross again, this son of a bitch comes at me again. Jeez. And, and, and he grabs me and Bruce, I was ready because I was trying to break his thumb. And I was going to poke his fucking eye out if he didn't let go, because I don't know whether he's armed or what, you know, you can't sure. mess around. Sure. And, and his cousin who was the valet is yelling at me. Don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. He's got brain damage. He's got brain damage. And Scheidner is, tr- is in there. It's sort of like a hockey fight at this point, wow. the two of us. And then the two people trying to break us up and we're against uh, the, the wall of the, the restaurant there, the outside brick wall. And suddenly two other people are trying to break up the fight. Dom Herrera, <laughs> his wife at the time, Lisa, who just happened by. <laughs> and so here's the funny part of the story, Bruce. I'm in the process of defending myself, trying to decide whether to blind someone. And I'm looking around and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, how did I get to the fucking round table of the improv? <laughs> And then for, for two days afterwards, Dom and, and Rich and I were tra- having phone calls, deconstructing this fight because we each had a little bit of information. Wow. And and, and if you ever have, have Rich Scheidner on the, on the show. Rich said he'd him. love to do the show and I'm going to have him and Dom has been resistant. So if you could mention it to him. I don't know whether Dom will remember the, well, first of all, Dom and I, we have never had any problem, but we're not friend right. friends. I mean, we're friendly. We know each other. But right. we never hung out. But if you ask Rich, he'll say, "Yeah, Kevin Kelton saved my ass." You know? Beautiful. And believe me, believe me, he didn't need me to save his ass. Rich, Rich Schneider can take care of himself. But I, 
I was and, happy to be he, able to help out a friend. And he's been through a lot. I know when he comes on the show, he's going to talk about oh, his great life. Great stories. Great yeah. stories. Yeah, well, Kev, and a great, great guy. Kevin, unbelievable that you shared so much history. We're able to document, understand what it's like, not just to be a, a stand-up, but to be a, a, a comedy writer and to have worked with such incredible people and the struggle and to making it to the heights of comedy writing. This has been fantastic. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your life with us here. Oh, I had a blast because I was talking about my favorite subject, myself. Yeah, well, you did great. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best in the future. And we'll stay connected through this show for a long time. So thank you, my friend. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for the invite. God bless. Now a quick word from one of our sponsors. Hey gang, I've been told by a lot of the comedians I knew and represented during the 80s, I look the same as I did 40 years ago. And come to think of it, I still have my thick brown hair and just a few wrinkles. But most importantly for me, by simply applying the completely safe human growth hormone homeopathic gel on my skin just two times a day, the depression and panic attacks I suffered from years ago were gone in just two weeks. And then I started deep sleeping for many hours at night. You know, you can have the gel work for you too. To find out more, contact me at Bruce at BruceStarProductions.com.